Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos to help you improve your chess game. Uh, even though I don't think that they're necessarily the videos that help you the most, the ones that get viewed the most are the ones I do on thought process. So I'm encouraged to do more on thought process, even though, as I said, a lot of the other ones are uh, just as helpful. So today I thought that we'd talk about thought process versus thought content, or I, I shouldn't even call it thought content. Basically what I'm saying is process are the things that you're doing in the order you're doing them in. The content is what actually happens when you do them. So for instance, a process might be, you know, if you're looking at a puzzle, first count the material of the puzzle to see what the story is. If you're behind three queens, maybe you're looking for a checkmate or a perpetual check. Um, in a game, hopefully you're always aware of what the material situation is and what you need to do. But your process, would depend on the position or, as I said, what kind of puzzle you have. Maybe your process in a game, you already know the material, so the first thing you're going to do is ask yourself, you know, is my opponent's move safe and what are all the things my opponent's move does as opposed to why did he make that move, which is probably a process error because if you miss one of the things that his move does, then that could be a problem. The content, on the other hand, is what your analysis shows, what your evaluation shows, when you count the material, what is the material? If you make a mistake doing that, that's not a process error. So let's call that a content error. A content error would be an error in your analysis or an error in your evaluation. You know, none of us are computers. We all make content errors. So the idea when you're teaching someone is to get them to have a better process so that they don't mess up because they didn't do something they were supposed to do. But you could have a perfect process and because you're human, you'll make a mistake. So I'd like to tell a story. I was playing a game against Rich Pariseau uh, maybe about 15 years ago. And I was playing an opening that I hadn't played a lot. And I was a little bit past the opening stage, maybe around move 12 or 13. And Rich had a candidate move, knight to d5, that I thought was a reasonable move. So it was my move. And I said, OK, if I make this move, what happens if Rich plays knight to d5? And I analyzed it and I said, all right, I have to take it. He has to take back with the pawn. Then I do this, then I do that. Okay, that should be okay for me. So finally I made the move and I went out to get a glass of water. And when I came back, Rich indeed had played knight to d5. And I said, all right, well, as I said before, I have to take it. He'll take back with the pawn. Then I go there. And then I said, uh-oh, I messed up. I misanalyzed the position. I can't go there. He could just do this, this, and this, and I win a pawn and my position falls. He wins a pawn and my position falls apart. I said, what can I do? And I realized there was nothing I could do. I just misanalyzed the position. So I looked and I looked and I looked and there was nothing I could do. So I had to take the knight. He took back. I made move the knight. He won a pawn and my position fell apart and I had to resign five moves later. So what did I learn from that? Well, really almost nothing other than the fact that I learned I was human. I did the same things I had always done that had made me a master level player. I just made a mistake in my analysis. Uh, you know, this happens once in a while. I took my time, I did the right process, I looked for the right things. I just messed up and analyzed it wrong and I thought it was, if he did that, that I would be okay and I had anticipated that move as a possible check capture or threat. But I just simply, didn't realize that I couldn't allow that move, and I lost the game. So that was not a process error, that was a content error. I did the process right, I just did the analysis wrong. So I thought what we might do is pick out a random position from the US Championship that was recently played, and let's see if we can figure out what our process is and what are some of the content of what we're doing when we're doing that. And that way we can define both the process and the content and we'll see what we can find. All right, so let's pick out a random game. US Championship, I think, had like 60-some games. So let's pick out a number. Let's pick out game number 47. US Champ, I have no idea which game this is. Percent 47. OK. It's Sevian against Lenderman. All right, let's pick Sevian's 23rd move or something. Let's quickly go through the game. E4, E6, French defense, classical, we got a Rubenstein. The main line here is knight takes F6 check. He does play that. Now you could play bishop to G5. You could also play bishop D3. 
bishop e3, that's a little bit rarer line. We call that a big pawn when you put the bishop on e3, where it's completely blocked in the one diagonal. The, the g1 to h7 diagonal is blocked in both directions. So we call that, when you do that with a bishop, it's a big pawn. It's obviously a good move. Sevian played it fairly quickly. We also can't tell by time because there could be process errors. Okay, so b6, getting ready to fianchetto the bishop. You do that a lot in these Rubinstein variations because the e6 pawn is blocking the bishop, so it makes sense to fianchetto it. Knight d5, hitting that bishop. White says, I don't want to give you the bishop pair. Black says, would you like to trade? White says, no, thank you. C5, the break move. Why is it a break move? Because it's a pawn hitting a pawn that can't go past, or at least can't easily go past. When you hit a pawn that can't easily go past your pawn with a pawn, that's a break move, or as we call it, a pawn break. We're going up to White's 23rd move. Bishop takes. So now Black has a four on three kingside majority. White has a three on two queenside majority. Other than that, things are pretty even. Bishop e4, queen c7. C4, getting that knight out of the middle. Knight f6, I expect White will trade bishops. Who knows? Yes, he does. Now white needs to develop his queen, and he does. Bishop back to e7. Bishop c3. Rooks go in the middle, hits the pawn. Queen guards the pawn, gets out of the line of the rook. a6, a4, knight d7. Rook a d1, developing the rook. Okay, black needs to make a move. Bishop f6. All right, so let's take a look. All right, if we treat this like a puzzle, white the play and find his best move, uh, let's count the material. That's going to be the first part of our process. So the material is both sides have six pawns, both sides have a bishop, both sides have a knight, both sides have two rooks, both sides have a queen. The material is even. So the process was to count the material. The content of the process was that the material is even. Okay. Uh, we have to evaluate, the, we, well, let's, let's evaluate the position a little bit as part of our process since uh, we haven't been playing the game, we've just been looking at it. And then we will start with our more of our move process. Uh, as we said, black has a four on three queen side majority, white has a three on two. Uh, white uh, could get a backward b pawn if black plays a five. Black, his rook is attacking the c4 pawn. It's guarded by the queen. White's rook ha is on the open d file. Black's rook has a semi-open c file. The rook on a8 is on a closed file. Um, both kings are relatively safe. White's king has a pawn on h3, which gives it luft. Black has no luft, so there could be back rank mate possibilities later in the game, unless black does something about that. Okay, um... All right, so let's look at what we would specifically do with the move. Black just played bishop f6. Is that move safe? Yes. I can't take off the knight on d7 because it's guarded by the queen. I can't take off the bishop on f6 and win anything because it's guarded by the knight or the pawn. The pawn on e6 is attacked by the queen and the rook, but it's guarded by the pawn on f7. So it looks like that move bishop f6 is safe. What are all the things bishop f6 does? Well, it neutralizes the diagonal. It uh, blocks white's bishop on c3 from attacking the g7 pawn. Uh, it no longer attacks the f8 to a3 diagonal, but white doesn't have any pieces on that diagonal. Uh, does it threaten anything? Yes, it threatens bishop takes c3, b takes c3, isolating all the pawns on the queen side, which would be a disaster. That would be a completely winning endgame for black if I let it be black's move and he played bishop takes c3, b takes c3. It's not so much the double pawns that's so bad. It's the fact that the double pawns are isolated on a semi-open file and the a pawn is isolated. That would be a complete disaster. So white has to stop the threat of bishop takes c3. So my process was to figure out what are all the things that bishop f6 did. My content is that one of the things it does, bishop takes c3, b takes c3, is a winning positional threat. So I can't just allow black to take the bishop on c3. Okay, but we're certainly not done our process because white has to figure out what are his candidate moves that would either counterattack so he can't do that or just directly defend that threat. 
All right, so let's see if we can find all the moves. So my process is to find all the moves that don't let black just play bishop takes c3. So for instance, the move queen e4 stops bishop takes c3, because if I play queen e4, white plays queen e4, and black plays bishop takes c3, then I can play queen takes b7 and win a queen. He could play bishop takes e1, but then I would play something like, I don't know, rook on d1 takes d7, threatening the f7 pawn and the bishop on e1. So obviously, queen e4, bishop takes c3, queen takes b7, bishop takes e1 is losing for black. But black could easily, after queen e4, just play queen takes e4, rook takes e4, bishop takes c3. Now, if white plays b takes c3, black can play knight c5, forking the rook on e4 and the pawn on a4. So after queen e4, queen takes e4, rook takes e4, bishop c3, white would play rook takes d7. But then black can just play bishop takes b2, saving the bishop and winning a pawn, and white has a rook on the seventh rank. But I don't think that's enough compensation. So I think queen e4, queen takes e4, rook takes e4, bishop takes c3, rook takes d7, bishop takes b2. Uh, white could play rook f4, hitting the the f7 pawn, he could play knight g5 hitting the f7 pawn, but it's not really convincing. So even though queen e4 isn't disastrous, it's probably not the best move. Okay, so we need to look at other candidate moves. Well, we certainly can just play bishop takes f6. If we play bishop takes f6, black can play either knight takes f6 or g takes f6. Playing g takes f6 with this many pieces on the board could open up the king a little bit. It doesn't look disastrous but it's probably not right. He'll just play knight takes f6. Then white could play something like knight to e5, uh, guarding the pawn on c4 a second time and getting the knight in a nice square. So that's not so bad. So bishop takes f6, whichever way black takes back, white is probably at least a little better. Um, so bishop takes f6 is a strong candidate move. Could white do something else? Can he play knight e5? Well, then black could trade off on e5 and take the pawn on c4. So let's take a look at that. Knight e5, knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, bishop takes e5, queen takes e5, rook takes c4. Okay, that loses a pawn, and white can't get his rook to the seventh rank. Uh, I don't see a lot of compensation, so I think knight e5 is probably not a good move here. Uh, what else could white play? Well, white could just guard the bishop on c3. He could play rook c1 or rook d3 or queen e3 or queen d3. Queen d3 guards the bishop and hits the knight on d7, but after bishop takes c3, probably queen takes d7 loses immediately to queen takes d7, rook takes d7, bishop takes e1. So after queen d3, bishop takes c3, we would have to pay, take back queen takes c3, but that puts the queen on the same line with the rook. And then black could play something like b5, and white can never play c takes b5. He could play a takes b5, but then after a takes b5, the b pawn's threatening c4, and the a file is now open for the rook on a8. So it looks like a move like queen d3 is not a very good move. So again, let's, let's differentiate my process from my content. My process is that I figured out the material's even. I figured out that black is threatening bishop takes c3. Uh, I started my processes. I started to find candidate moves that would not let black play bishop takes c3. Um, I'm trying to figure out which of those candidate moves are good. So far we've said white could play bishop takes f6. I guess white could also put something on d4. He could play bishop d4 or knight d4 so that if black captures on d4, white can just take back. So for instance, bishop d4, bishop takes d4. I could play rook takes d4 and double the rooks. Uh, in some of those lines, black's going to play knight to c5 and hit the pawn on a4, and I can't easily guard it with b3 because knight takes on b3. So, for instance, if I do play, let's say, bishop d4, then bishop takes d4, knight takes d4, knight c5 hits the a4 pawn, and it's a little awkward because I, I can play b3 there because the knight on d4 is guarding b3. So bishop d4, bishop takes d4, knight takes d4, knight c5, b3 is safe, but it seems like it's just better just to take the bishop on f6. So putting a piece on d4 does stop 
bishop takes c3. Now I could just move the bishop on c3 to let's say bishop b4, but then the question is, what happens if black just plays bishop takes b2? Do I have compensation? And why would I want to do that? And the answer is, I don't see a lot. Bishop c4, bishop takes b2, isolates white's pawns on c4 and a4. And it looks like uh, black can just play bishop takes b2. All right, so I would continue my, pro my process of finding moves that might stop bishop takes c3, analyzing those moves, comparing the moves. Comparing the moves is part of the process. And so far, my comparison shows that white's position is relatively the best if I stop the knight from going to c5 and I just play maybe bishop takes f6. So if I were to stop my process here, I would say that Grandmaster Sevian played bishop takes f6 with maybe a very slight advantage is my evaluation. Let's see what he did. Bishop takes f6. And he took about a minute to decide that that was his best move and we would expect Lenderman would fairly quickly play knight takes f6. And he did, he played that pretty much immediately. Okay, so they played as expected. Let's, let's take one more position and we'll, we'll, we'll go through the process again and we'll look at a little bit of the content. So we just did number like 47, let's do number 51. Examine US champ 20% 51. Get it out of the ICC library here. Uh, Ramirez against Sevian. Okay, this time let's take, well we just did one for Sevian, so we'll do white again. We'll see what Ramirez is doing. Let's take white's, uh, oh we just did the 23rd move, let's take the 27th move. All right, so e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, Roy Lopez, a6. Knight c3, rare line. Usually white either castles there or plays c3. The, the reason why you don't like to put the knight on c3 in Roy Lopez is because you want to play c3 and d4, and when he takes with a pawn, you can recapture with a pawn. And also, when he plays b5 and knight to a5 to try to win the bishop pair, the bishop can sneak back to c2. So here the bishop can get stuck on the side of the board, but you know, this is a rare line, but it's not a bad line. And of course, these days the grandmasters play a lot of Gioco pianissimos, and this line in the Roy Lopez resembles that. And I'm sure Ramirez, you know, has played all this out and knows the book ideas for white here. So Sevian says, all right, let's put that bishop back on b3. He plays bishop c5. So it's a little bit like a Gioco Piano where, where white has played his bishop back from c4 to b3 and black has gotten these pawn expansions, which gives white a chance later maybe to play a4 and break up the pawns. So knight d5. And now, of course, black could take the pawn on e4, and this is all going to be a bookie kind of thing. Black says, no, thank you. I will just develop my bishop. White castles. Black says, give me that bishop pair. White says, all right, I will play there. And now White's out of his book. He's already down to 16 minutes. So we're getting some interesting play here. Black says, thanks for the bishop pair. White takes away from the center. We're seeing a lot of things going against general opening principles. But of course, these are grandmasters. They're not too worried about that. They're just analyzing what they think are the best moves. Black takes the pawn. White pins the knight. Black takes the knight, white takes back, black simply castles. White hits the bishop, the bishop goes back to get out of the pin, and white takes with the queen to get his pawn back. So white has an isolated deep pawn, he has double pawns in the b-file, but he has more space in the center. White's down to 10 minutes left. We're going for white's, uh, what did I say, 20, I forget what it was. Let's do his 26th move, knight back h4, h6, goodbye Mr. Bishop, he goes back to e3, Bishop f6 hitting the queen, queen g4 basically saying to black, if you want to take my b2 pawn, I might take on h6 in some lines, he does, white says let me hit the bishop, black counterattacks the queen, queen back, queen f6, stopping, well on bishop h6, if queen takes h6, then rook takes b2. So we do have an overworked queen. Let's see if Ramirez decides to do that. Yes, he does. Bishop takes h6. 
Notice how my tactical vision picks that up, that the queen's overworked, and therefore bishop h6 is safe. Queen takes, rook takes b2. Black says, if you trade queens, I can take with the knight and come up in the middle and attack your isolated pawn. And he doesn't take with the knight. He takes with the pawn, and he double and isolates his pawn. It says Ramirez has negative time, but that's because it's a relay here, and they'll fix the times in a couple moves. Rook goes to the open file. Knight develops hitting the isolated pawn. White says, you can have that pawn. If you do, maybe I'll skewer the knight and the isolated pawns. Black says, I'll just guard my F pawn. White plays knight g5. We're going for white's 26th move. Rook e8. Okay, so process. Count the material. Material, both sides have six pawns. Both sides have a knight and two rooks. Material is even. Next part of the process, uh, do an evaluation of the position. Uh, white has an isolated pawn on d5. Black has doubled isolated pawns on d d67. Uh, white has control of the open c file. He can penetrate down to c7 if he wants to. Neither side's king is getting back rank mated. Uh, black could play knight g4 and then rook e1 mate if, if white's not too careful. I don't think that's going to happen. Black always has the g7 square. The knight on g5 is a nice outpost. Uh, the knight on f6 is a pretty good knight. It's hitting the pawn on d5, and it can go up to g4 or e4. Um, the rook on a8 is probably the worst piece on the board right now, but it could, it's coordinated with the rook on e8. So it looks like white is a little bit better here. Um, all right, so if we're looking at the move, black has just played rook f8. Is that move safe? Yes. Everything's guarded right now. Uh, white isn't forcibly winning much material here. Um, what are all the things rook fe8 does? Well, it abandons the f file, but there wasn't much happening. The knight on f6 was safe anyway. Puts the rook on an open file. Uh, there are no targets right now on the open file. An open file, by the way, is one with no pawns, but it could have targets that are pieces. Um, the two rooks are coordinated. The rook on e8 is guarded by the rook on a8. They're both guarding the c8 square. Um, the rook on e8 could go up to e5 and hit the d-pawn again. So if white decides to just guard the d-pawn here with a move like rook d2, black could play rook e5. Um, the rook is also guarding the e4 square. So if he puts the knight there and white, white's knight takes it, he could take back with the rook without having to take with the f pawn, which would be a little bit awkward for his pawn structure. Uh, the rook, let's see, the rook would, in some lines, if white plays rook c7, hitting the pawn on d7, then black could play rook e2, counterattacking the pawn on a2. So there's a lot of things that rook on e8 does. It also opens up the f8 square for the black king. I don't think that's very consequential. The black king doesn't know it. So again, my process is, you know, I'm asking myself, is the move safe? What are all the things that move does? Um, now I need to come up with some candidate moves for white. We already said white could guard the pawn on d5 with one of the rooks. He could play rook d2 or rook d1. I doubt he's going to do that. He could have done that before. He can counterattack. He could play rook to c7. He's not threatening rook takes d7, but if black ever plays knight takes d5, then white could play rook takes d7, and that rook on d7 would be a monster, and white would be threatening to double the rooks in some lines. So rook to c7 is a candidate move. What are, what are other candidate moves here? Uh, white could play f3 to keep the black pieces out of e4, and then bring his king to the middle with king to f2. He could play f4 to keep the rook out of e5, but that makes the pawn on f4 weak, and it also weakens the e4 square. So f4 is a candidate move. It does something. A candidate move is a move that does something positive. E f4 is a candidate move because it keeps the rook out of e5 where he could add more pressure to the... See, black doesn't want to play knight takes d5 if the rook's on c7 because then he would lose the pawn on d7. But if he could take the pawn with the rook, that's a whole different story then the knight would continue to guard the d7 square. So f4 stops that, but I think the cost is too great. So I don't think white's going to play f4. 
Uh, white can play f3. Is there any reason, to, is there a knight move that's a candidate move? Knight f3 to keep the rook out of e5? Um, I guess. I still kind of like rook to c7. The idea of rook to c7 is to kind of freeze the black knight. And then later on, I could maybe do some things that would encourage that knight to move. Maybe I could offer the trade of knights with some a knight maneuver. But I, I would like to tie black's pieces down to guarding that pawn on d7. And I certainly would, wouldn't mind trading my d5 pawn for his d7 pawn. But if I play rook to c7 right away, then knight takes d5 is probably not going to be black's move. So that's a, that's... The, the content. The content is once I identifying candidate moves is my is my process and actually listing them and, and analyzing them to see how good they are, that's my content. So again, process, figure out what each side's trying to do, process based on what they're trying to do, what are the candidate moves, but the content is what are the candidate, uh, the content is finding those candidate moves and then figuring out what's going to happen after you make those moves and then evaluating those positions and then comparing the positions with each other to see which move you like better. So for instance, suppose you have a candidate move A and a candidate move X. And suppose after candidate move A, you think it's very likely your opponent will make a reply B. And you think if he makes reply B, that allows you to do reply C. So that says if I do A, I'm probably going to get into position after A, B, C. So we'll call that position like C prime. C prime is the position after your next move C. So you make move A, he makes move B, you make move C, that creates position C prime. Then we could do the same thing with other candidate move X. You make move X, let's say he makes move Y, you could then make move Z, and if that happens, you then get position Z prime, and then you evaluate Z prime, and then you compare the evaluation of C prime with the evaluation of position Z prime, and whichever one you like better, better is probably tells you whether you like move A better or that you like move X better. So that's the process. But actually doing it and figuring out what is A, B, C, what is X, Y, Z, what's the evaluation of Z prime, what's the evaluation of, of C prime, and could you visualize C prime and can you visualize Z prime, those are the contents of what you're doing. So you could make an error either way. You can make a process error where you forget to look for his checks, captures, and threats and play hope chess, or you could get a position where you need to analyze carefully, and you could not analyze carefully and just move on principle, which I call hand-waving, or you could get into a position where you need to think long and hard because it's a critical position, and you don't think long and hard even though you have lots of time and you play too fast. That's a process error to play too fast. Those are all process errors, and you can make terrible mistakes making those process errors and lose the game right away. Or you can make a content error. For instance, when I lose to another master, it could be that I look at ABC and XYZ, and I decide that ABC is a better sequence for me, and I play A, and it turns out later I was right about ABC and XYZ. The thing I was wrong about was that actually Z prime was better for me than C prime, and I picked, I picked uh, C prime instead and my position deteriorated, and then I ended up losing the game. If I had played the XYZ line and played X, then I would have been able to hold the draw. Well, that's, that's a content error, not a process error. I did the whole process the right. I just evaluated the position a little bit incorrectly, and I thought that C prime might be equally good or better than Z prime, when in fact Z prime is a little bit better than C prime, and making mistakes like that cost me the game. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed today's video on... Uh, thought process and thought content. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so and tell your friends about the channel. The more you tell your friends, the better we can do. Okay, thanks a lot. Hopefully we can help everybody. See you next time. Bye.